Welcome back, everyone. Um, our next panel is administrative hurdles uh, to core sharing. And so I think this panel is going to relate very much to the first one of the day. Some of the same issues might come up. Um, so we can touch on those um, with kind of different perspectives. And so uh, we have today we have Karen Campbell, who's the associate dean here at Vanderbilt. And she was intimately involved in the establishment, as she mentioned this morning, in the establishment of this partnership that we have with Duke and UVA. And so she'll speak about her perspective um, for getting that going and the hurdles that they had to overcome um, to make that happen. And then we have Mary Jo, who will continue to talk about uh, Seassi. Am I saying it correctly? Seassi uh, from the administrative point of view. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here to hear more of the conversation because I expect that some of what I have to say will be uh, redundant. But I, I have to say, and Avery's heard this joke before, that um, in terms of language capacity, I'm probably, I'm certainly the person in this room who is the least qualified to be speaking because I speak the southern version of U.S. English and scuba language, and that's about it. Um, I did. Oh uh, yeah, I can curse underwater. <laughs> um, but I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see so many people here. I'm delighted our weather is good. Um, I'm delighted to be able to report to those of you with North Carolina connections that the score in the Duke men's basketball game, the NCAA game this afternoon was Duke 93, UNC Wilmington 85. Those of you from Duke can cheer, those of you from Carolina can boo. So, um, um, I didn't actually come in on the ground floor of this because Duke and UVA had already established a partnership um, and then in invited us in. I wasn't even part of the original conversations, but I got on board uh, January a year ago. Um, for what my predecessor in the Dean's Office, John Sloop, has called the Tiny Languages Partnership <laughs> and what Marika Zattler, and I think she borrowed this term from others but she's the first person I heard it for, from, talks about orchid languages, languages that are small, beautiful, fragile, and in need of protection <laughs> and care. Um, so this is a very new enterprise for me. Uh, it's been quite the learning experience and it's really fun. I go several times a semester and sit in our telepresence classroom and watch these languages either being taught from here at Vanderbilt or being taught from Duke or UVA and I don't understand a word of what's being said and it's wonderful. Um, I, I want to especially from the point of view of our partnership, acknowledge the instructors for these courses. Jacques Pierre is here from Duke, and of course, you know he teaches Haitian Creole. Uh, Setan Nepali, who teaches Tibetan and is actually in Nepal this semester for family reasons, teaching from there. And Marika Zadler, who you've met, who teaches uh, Kiche Mayan. Um, I have two counterparts, uh, Inga Walther from Duke, who coordinates the partnership for this initial three-year term. Inga had planned to be here, but she has to leave for China tomorrow, and she decided maybe she would just send her regards and her regrets. So I will be channeling some of Inga's observations. And then Miao Fen Tseng um, at UVA. Um, but this is truly an enterprise or a partnership or a consortium or whatever you want to call it that takes a village. So this Vanderbilt's entry into this partnership started with a conversation in the provost's office. Um, I have gotten support and Marika has gotten support from the Center for Teaching, the Center for Latin American Studies, the Center for Second Language Studies, Vanderbilt Information Technology, three departments, the Arts and Science Dean's Office, um, and I've probably forgotten something and I apologize if I have. So this is a very um, collaborative uh, partnership. Um, I, I know the focus of this workshop is broader than, than this, but um, this, for this panel I am going to talk about sort of the administrative challenges and some opportunities. Um, one of the areas of challenge is sort of the political landscape. And I imagine that y'all have talked some about this already today. Um, but in terms of having a partnership in which languages are being taught by telepresence from faculty on other campuses, 
One of the concerns that I hear from faculty members sort of on the fringes of this conversation is, well, isn't this just a way for universities to replace faculty members, to not hire faculty members on their campus and to instead use resources from other campuses? And so when I talk with others about the partnership, I, what I try to emphasize is that the languages that are now available to our students through this partnership, Haitian Creole and Tibetan for the Vanderbilt students, have, as far as I know, never been taught on this campus and were not likely to be high on our list of, of curricular development. So this really is something that enhances students' opportunities. Um, and I know that at least for Maraika's Kiche classes, there are a couple of faculty members who are taking courses as well. So it's not just about opportunities for students, but also opportunities for faculty member to gain access to language instruction that otherwise would simply be absent from the campus. Um, another sort of political issue is the cost per student of providing this kind of instruction. Um, we had a fund at Vanderbilt that's externally funded um, that had accrued significant dollars and we tapped that for the $75,000 that we spent to convert a small classroom to a two camera telepresence um, setup. Um, I know you're supposed to observe after this session. Okay, are, are you all going to Calhoun 335? We're going in groups. Okay, because so Calhoun 335 is a small classroom. Um, it really comfortably accommodates maybe eight to ten students within view of the cameras. Um, when I go to class, I'm very careful to sit out of the view of the cameras. Um, but $75,000 for what is to this point relatively small enrollment um, is a fairly substantial chunk of change. Um, the maintenance agreement is $1,500 a year and I got um, someone in the provost's office to agree to cover that for the first year. I don't know where that maintenance money is going to come from next year. Um, I think it was a very good investment. I'm delighted with the way this has turned out, but I know that there are people on campus who would say, how else might we have spent those $75,000? We do hope to eventually expand use of our classroom to other uses. Um, I tried to convince uh, a political scientist here who's sort of co-teaching a course with a colleague at UVA to use a classroom. It didn't work out and it's kind of nice to have it for the exclusive use of our language classes because it means we don't have any scheduling problems. But we could easily use it for dissertation defenses, for example, where one faculty member is physically away from campus. Um, so there will be other uses for that classroom. But those are sort of some of the, what I would say, political or cost benefit um, conversations that I've encountered. Um, logistical challenges are the things that I heard referred to when I was here earlier this morning. And those are the things that probably make Miaofen, Inga, and I lose the most sleep. Um, there are time and space challenges. We have, with these three campuses involved, three different academic calendars, three different ways of scheduling classes. Jacques is there nodding his head. Three different final exam schedules. Uh, two different time zones. Uh, it, was, it was cleaner when it was simply Duke and UVA and then Vanderbilt interloped and added the central time zone. And I, I know somebody was talking about Utah and Pitt. Pitt. Okay, so you've faced greater challenges in terms of time zones, but a class scheduled at Duke or UVA at 8.30 in the morning is a little bit early for undergraduates, but it's 7.30 here. And our classes scheduled from 4 to 5.15 Central Time, you know, are getting a little late in the afternoon for the students on East Coast time. So that's a challenge. Um, I mentioned earlier that for family reasons, the instructor of Tibetan this year or this semester is actually in Nepal. So that presents another time-space challenge, which the students and uh, Professor Nepali have handled beautifully. Um, but you know, that's another challenge. Um, the technology itself, and I know you talked about this, and, and I am not an expert. All I can say is we have a two-camera system, and that's a, a three-screen system. That's about all I can tell you. Um, 
the students are so comfortable with different kinds of technology that they are unfazed by times when the technology fails and we've had very good support from Vanderbilt IT for this. Um, they can switch to Skype in, in in an instant if necessary. So I describe our classroom to people who haven't seen it as Skype on steroids. Um, but the students are really very uh, nimble um, and much less frazzled than I would be um, when the technology fails or, or falters in some way. Um, another challenge is getting the word out. Um, here we, we have a website that is time for us to update with uh, times for classes for, for the fall semester, but we have a website, but you know, people don't automatically stumble onto that website. Um, we send word out about the classes to our directors of undergraduate studies in all departments, but particularly to directors of undergraduate studies in the language departments. We have about a dozen pre-major advisors who advise all of our arts and science students prior to their declaring a major. And we make sure that they know about the classes. We send notifications out to the deans in the under, uh, other undergraduate schools in case there's that intrepid engineer who wants to take Tibetan on the side. Um, there are wonderful serendipitous moments of one-to-one -one contact with a student I went last let's see, it would have been last spring, to um, see student research on a class that was about immigrant journeys in Nashville. And one student was talking about the Haitian immigrants that she had talked about and what work they were doing in Nashville. And she said, I, I learned a little bit of Creole from them, but I, I really wish I could speak it. And I said, well, you know, we offer Haitian Creole. And she said, really? And so I have her name written down, Jacques. I'm going to make sure that uh, she knows when the classes are being offered. Um, so there are those little serendipitous moments, but they're not enough to get enough students into the class. And so this is a challenge that we face, is how do we get the word out? Um, because our students are intrepid, and they will take these classes. Um, we we have general education requirements at the College of Arts and Science that are pretty, um, I don't know, insular, I guess I would say, in the sense that for students who, once they have come to Vanderbilt, only courses taken in the College of Arts and Science count toward our general education requirements. But I managed to work with the committee that oversees our general education requirements, and they agreed to both count the partnership courses toward the international cultures requirement and to accept those courses as evidence of foreign language proficiency. Um, so that that removed a barrier that might have kept some students out of these classes as, oh, is this going to count for Axel or not? Um, I know all of you know this. One of the biggest administrative hurdles is the time and person hours or the person hours spent in this and the changing cast of characters. So each of the colleges of arts and science in Duke, at Duke, UVA, and Vanderbilt has had a new dean in the three years that this partnership has been in place. Um, here at Vanderbilt, where actually Carol Endeavor was the dean when we kicked this off, John Sloop was the interim dean, and now we have Lori Benton. So we've actually had three deans in the time that we've been working on this partnership. Faculty members come and go, as you well know. So Miao Fen at UVA stepped in after her predecessor in the part partnership took a job elsewhere. Um, Inga tells me that the Yale Cornell Columbia Consortium, I know that they have external funds and that they have a full-time director paid out of those funds. For most of us, um, around this table who are involved in these kind of partnerships. This is work that we do on top of other work that we do. Um, and Inga, I forget exactly what the title is, but she's now director of their German language program on top of everything else. So this is a challenge because this is the kind of thing that requires a lot of careful attention. You've got to get the courses scheduled, coordinated. Um, there's a lot of, of, of detail work to be done and yet it, it it's easy to have it fall off of our plates a little bit, so that's of concern, sort of um, both succession, maintenance of institutional knowledge and practices, um, and just getting the work done.
And then one last thing that, that Inga mentioned in this, this area, and then I've got one more topic I want to talk about, um, and that is how do we manage students' evaluations of these classes? Again, typically three different systems for doing so. Um, and how do we assess student learning and outcomes for our accrediting agencies, again, across, in our case, three different campuses? So the last thing I want to talk about is um, what I have called enrichment challenges and opportunities. And again, I, I'm really channeling Inga here, but um, there is a continued need for more training of faculty. Um, Marika stepped in, hardly blinked when I said, wouldn't you love to take your Kiche class and teach it in front of a couple of cameras and have <laughs> students on three screens and not know exactly who you're talking to? And she was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, and Derek Bruff has been very helpful from the Center for Teaching in helping her get prepared to do this. But, um, and, and I don't even know what Jacques' experience has been, but summer workshops on how we use these technologies, how we draw in online resources for students, um, you know, workshops for administrators on how we find external funds for these kinds of partnerships. Um, how do we connect students who are interested in a language to other language resources on campus? Um, so I, I, I described the situation where I sort of serendipitously found out that this student was wishing for a course in Haitian Creole, but how would I then put that student and other students in the Creole class in conversation with folks on campus? Um, graduate students, for example, or faculty members who either speak Haitian Creole or have an interest in the history, politics, sociology, of, uh, of Haiti. Uh, Jacques does a great job through his YouTube videos of um, introducing students and also in the context of the class introducing students to the culture and the history of Haiti but how do we support that on campus um, for the students who are here. Um, we'd all like to have more in-person interaction. The telepresence is great. It does allow us to offer these languages to students who would not otherwise have access to them. But there's really nothing like sitting down in a room and being able to talk to people the way that y'all have done today. Um, Mao Fen, uh, Inga and I met January a year ago. That was my first um, dive into the partnership at UVA. It was a great couple of days. It was one of those experiences where I felt like I was trying to drink from a fire hose and you know, take in so much information. But we need more opportunities for that. Um, when it was just a partnership between Duke and UVA, students actually took the opportunity. They, I, I think, um, said let's to get together. It's not that far a drive. And then Vanderbilt joined the consortium and now it's you know an eight-hour drive and we haven't managed to, to gather all of the students in a single language class together um, physically. Um, and then the last thing that, that Inga raised, and uh, again I know this is something that Jacques is interested in, but it gives me the heebie-jeebies, and that is scaling up these partnerships adding additional languages, bringing in additional institutional partners. Um, I, I think I am at the limit of what organizational theorists call bounded rationality. I don't think I can think about another institution or another language, and yet I know that that's probably what we need to be thinking about. Um, so that's all I have to say for right now, and thanks again to Miao Fen and Inga and to our wonderful instructors for being with their students uh, intrepid. So thanks very much. To, to come here, um, it was in the context of technology kinds of stuff, and, um, so oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay.
when I my first reaction was, well, you know, the technology is, is kind of, it's, it's developing and changing and, and gradually sorting itself out, but the administrative stuff is not sorting itself out and is just kind of getting harder in, in, a, in the context of shrinking resources, cuts to education budgets here and there and everywhere, and um, uh, coming from the state of Wisconsin, we've had significant cuts to education budgets from our state. Um, so you know, as as the technology is 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 getting better, the puzzle is getting harder to put together uh, in terms of financial uh, problems. So, so I asked um, Professor Horn if I could if I could talk about administrative stuff. So here I am again. Um, so anyway, just a couple of caveats. One of which I, I uh, we've already talked about. I, I wasn't sure who all I'd be talking to. So anyway, but just. Uh, to make it clear that, that I just want to be talking about, you know, synchronous language instruction, not self-study things at all. Um, and then the other caveat that I want to make sure people understand is I, I am, um, I'm not a researcher on this topic um, and I'm not a language teacher. Um, so I've, I've got 17 years or so of experience now with with a, a less commonly taught language summer intensive program um, but I, I took a, a screenshot of my desk I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I'm just an administrator <laughs> so, so you know kind of like what you were saying the the um, Getting into distance language instruction is is not it's not part of your job description. It's not part of my job description. Um, it's just you know seeing a need and trying to respond and trying to to make things work. So anyway, um, one of the ways that I've been thinking about this is I mean in terms of the the market, right? And we've talked about this before that 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 interest is scattered in for as far as I can tell for any less commonly taught language, uh, you know, scattered both widely and sparsely across the United States. Um, so the best way I can, s that I know of to illustrate this is for, for my little summer language program. So in the past 15 years, we've had yeah, 2,127 students attending um, the Southeast Asian Studies Summer Institute. Uh, because our mandate is to serve the nation, it's not an institution to institution thing, but if you're thinking about, you know, how to, how to scale up, right? This is one way of understanding the scale. So here is a list of home universities from which students who are interested in a Southeast Asian language are coming. So, all right, keep going. We can keep going some more. <laughs> um, and we can keep going some more. So that's a lot, and, and that's the people who have actually attended. Now, you know, there's also people who applied and for whatever reason didn't attend. But thinking about scalability, um, Think carefully. I mean, in my in in my dream world, and I know this is just probably a pipe dream, or at least in my lifetime, it'll probably be a, be a pipe dream. Um, but um, you know, the the ideal is you know that that students from any location could study a less commonly taught language in a predictable affordable manner, you know, via distance education, that would be wonderful. That's, that's a dream. I, I don't know how to make that happen at this point, but anyway, I just thought I'd put it out there. Um, so if you're thinking about, about you know, who's, who is going to be taking a, a less commonly taught language, some, some common common characteristics that differ from undergrad to grad to returning adult students and the percentages I put on here are just from the, from my own experience right as it may be different for Latin American languages I have no idea but for for inquiries that I get for Southeast Asian language instruction from around the country um, you know most of them are grad students but there's a big chunk of undergrads 
And then there's also some returning adult students, right? Um, most of the undergrads, at least that, that, that I encounter, you know, they're, they want to study Thai or Vietnamese or Khmer or whatever. Um, motivation typically comes from a personal experience, either, you know, a, a family member or, you know, their heritage student or the, some family connection or a, a friendship or something like that. Um, since they're undergraduate students, time, I wanna, I'm going to emphasize a little bit thinking about um, you know, how much time students have to devote to stuff. So, so for both undergrad and grad students, they've made the commitment to be students. So they have time to study. Um, and the biggest difference, the two differences between undergraduates and graduates, you know, one, one is that, that graduate students usually often have a personal motivation to study the language that they're interested in, but they also have a research interest and that tends to keep them going farther and longer into more, you know, advanced levels of language. Um, and graduate students, just the way funding, floss funding and other fellowships work, people are more interested, uh, funding agencies are more interested in putting their money into research-driven projects. Um, projects that will have an impact beyond just the students' own needs, right? So, Grad students have more funding than undergrads usually do. Um, the reason why I wanted to focus a little bit on returning adult students is that when I've talked to various, uh, especially people who um, are encouraging encouraging my program to you know to grow and and uh, you know reach out to new student populations. Um, there's, the, I, I, I'm getting the impression that, that there, there's an idea that, oh, well, if you just, if you put it as a distance program, there'll be lots more people and, and you can, you know, solve some of the numbers problems by having more students. I've talked to a lot of people who, who would be returning adult students and, and some of them do wind up attending, you know, maybe 10% of our students, but time, their time is so limited. And the time it takes to actually engage in, in less common uh, in any language study is is very large. So, um, <laughs> for returning adult students, you know, it, it's they often just don't have the time to devote to it. So it's just a, a note of caution as people are are thinking about, um, you know, is it possible to to uh, how do I put it? Is it possible to, to, to solve some of the financial problems by growing your program more and more? There, I think, is a real limit to how many returning adult students can actually devote the time that it takes. So, anyway, there are some, but not a lot. Um, we've talked about this already a lot, so I won't go into it too much, but in terms of how to, how to you know barriers to to making this work funding is 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 the hardest one so some programs you know are uh, self-funding like like the summer intensive language programs like like I coordinate um, grant funding helps I've heard of uh, you know some of the the melon funded programs um, I don't know of any university extension course I mean there are a lot of like distance language more on the order of, of computer-aided correspondence courses or something. Um, but they're not really for synchronous instruction, so I'm not going to say any more about them. Um, and I don't know about other universities. Our university is trying to, to uh, uh, encourage units to, to develop. It's called educational innovation where, where a unit can, can capture revenue. You were talking about it with your university. Um, but I think our university and others that I've heard of are, are looking at it as they will they will give a kickback to the or you know uh, uh, they will share the revenue with the, the the unit that's doing it, but they want a whole lot of the revenue. So like in our university's case with educational innovation programs, if you can get one approved, uh, there's a, a lot of ifs to it. I mean, there's a lot of of uh, of, of regulations as to what they would approve, is what I mean. But still, the university 
you know, whatever the college that you're in will want to, to, to keep a third of the revenue that, that would be generated from such a thing. So as I've tried to put the numbers together for less commonly taught languages, you know, to take a, a market that doesn't have a lot, you know, the students don't have a lot of money, and then to try to create something that could actually pay teacher salaries, but give a 33% of it over to the dean's office just to be allowed to exist, I can't make the numbers work yet. <laughs> so, so I don't know if there are other universities, I'd be curious to find out if there are other universities that are trying to encourage you know, innovation and to use distance technology, distance education to create a self-sustaining kind of a program. And in so many ways, it's so frustrating because this could really, you know, I think in terms of the technology, this could really work, but not with a 33% tax. I, I can't figure out how to make that work yet. So, um, so and then the, the other kind of, of funding model that we've talked about a lot, which uh, is, is, um, is, oh, hang on, I'm gonna back up once. Another self-funding model that we've, we've had a few uh, inquiries, but never really had a chance to get it off the ground. But one thing to, to maybe discuss is we've had, we've been approached a couple of times by universities saying, I'm just gonna leave names out, please, but, but um, saying, okay, we've got, we just so happen this year to have, uh, you know, five or six students who want to study uh, um, you know, Thai language, but we don't have a Thai language instructor at our university, and so, and we don't want to hire one. So, could you, UW Madison, you know, provide distance education where it would be sort of a university to university thing, but not wh where, you know, if, if the other university, the, the receiving university, could just send a fee, like a per student fee, um, to us? And, and that's maybe something to talk about or to think about. You know, we've only had a couple of kind of nibbles in that, uh, along those lines. Um, and again, it takes a lot of, uh, uh, it takes a lot of time to develop something like that. So it, it's something that I suppose could be explored. Right now we don't have something, you know, a, a, an on-the-shelf package that we could, you know, if we get a call from another university that asks something like that, we could just trot it out and say, boom, here it is. We don't have that yet. But as I think about it, that might be something that's, that's viable. It's gonna, de it would depend on the cost. So anyway, um, then I, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about, uh, you know, revenue neutral exchange where, you know, each, un each student pays t tuition to his or her home university and then the institutions work out the exchange. Um, we have a lot of that expertise sitting around the room. Um, I do have uh, s some slides and, and a couple of things just to say about two institutions is, um, our Center for Southeast Asian Studies has, has developed a, a relationship with University of California, Berkeley, and then a separate, you know, relationship with a Northern Illinois University for just a two-institution exchange um, where Berkeley offers Khmer instruction, we don't, we offer third-year Thai, they don't, so, you know, we've, we've, we just exchange those two things only. Um, similarly, Burmese and Vietnamese language between us and Northern Illinois University. We have developed, uh, and I've gotten permission from our dean's office, if, if somebody wants to get a copy of, you know, we've got sort of, uh, they've developed a kind of a template MOU <laughs> um, for that kind of exchange. And I'm, I'm happy to share that uh, with people because it's been, you know, it's been sort of looked at from, you know, the, the departments that would be, the language teaching departments that would be involved as well as, um, you know, university legal offices and provost offices for accreditation purposes and stuff. So anyway, um, hard not to crack money. <laughs> um, so I just want to go into this a little bit, st just I don't have any great solutions, but just to understand, you know, for if, if you're trying to develop a program that that is not dependent on uh, uh, that 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 gets its funding from students, you know, where you're where you're trying to capture tuition, um, 
just to keep in mind, you know, that if students are paying tuition to their home institution, they're, they're, they're not going to have enough money to pay. We've, we've had a sum total of one person who could afford to be a non-resident <laughs> student as a distant student during the academic year. She had a postdoc with a grant that had money for, you know, instruction. So we've had one academic year distant student who could fund herself to be non-resident tuition paying student. It's very rare. Um, and the other thing, I've spent a lot of time talking to financial aid offices around the country. <laughs> so most country, uh, most universities don't, I mean, they, they, it's very hard for, to get them to permit, you know, say the student's financial aid from their home university to travel to another university, you know, to pay our tuition. Um, and of course, there's the non-resident versus resident tuition rates uh, during the academic year, which is a problem. Um, so I'm going to skip that slide, I guess. Another thing to think about as I, um, I, I think, well, no, I guess I did talk about this already, that, you know, that as we're trying to develop models, it seems to me like there are some powers on campus that really want us to, to create distance education mostly to help their their revenue gap problems. <laughs> so, so anyway. Um, one other administrative barrier, and we've talked about it some already, but, but just um, the impact of, of when, when a, uh, an instructor who has been, you know, doing his or her job teaching a, a, a language is told, you know, now you're going to have distance students too. <laughs> um, the first impression that I've, that I've dealt with with, with very, various instructors is, is the f kind of feeling overwhelmed. It's just, oh my gosh, there's all this technology to learn and all this stuff. And, and um, so again, it's just to, to encourage uh, people as you're thinking about stuff to um, to consider this so you know from a from a like a human because what I've asked uh, from our like human resources side of things is well this is more work for the teacher can we pay the teach the uh, teacher who's got distance education students can we pay him or her more than somebody who doesn't and the answer from the HR point of view is well you know, no. <laughs> um, and there's all kinds of, and I, I'm not criticizing that, there's all kinds of reasons why I say, you know, somebody who's got a, a class of 20 students in Japanese, and then I've got a, a teacher for Indonesian who's, who's only got six students here, and I want to put, you know, one or two distant students in the class. The, the HR point of view is, well, you know, it's already unfair, so what are you guys complaining about, right? Um, on the other side, the instructor can, I can certainly understand, can feel, uh, you know, justifiably like um, that they're being asked to do more work with no additional pay, right? So it's just a tension to be aware of and to, to uh, the only way to deal with it is to, you know, sit down and talk it through and work, work it through and, and come to, you know, uh, something that, that works for, for everybody. So I'm just putting it out there as, as something to, um, you know, to be aware of. And honestly, I put through all of these, you know, things, but various other presenters have talked about them already. You just talked about several of them. So I didn't know when I was preparing this, you know, how much information there would be on, on you know, dealing with timing and course descriptions and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, these slides are just, you know, taking information from the MO, this template MOU that we've developed for a two-institution revenue neutral exchange. Um, so I'll just run through these very quickly. The only, in terms of timing, you know, we'd all talked about that, you know, timetables are built very, um, very far in advance. So, so we've set ourselves a deadline. If there's going to be an exchange, we have to know by the end of April for the fall semester or by the end of October for the following <coughs> spring semester. Um, in the, the course description, as students are enrolling, and again, on the course syllabus, you know, students in each institution need to 
know before they enroll or as they're enrolling that there will be distance students too. Um, da -da -da. Let's see. We, like everybody else here, it sounds like, you know, follow the, the, the sending institution schedule is the schedule for the course. Um, I don't know why the odd font problem is there. Um, let's see. <coughs> a, a lot of these we've already talked about, I think. Um, Da, 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 da. Courses listed in both institutions. We try to go by a five-year average to make sure that it's it's you know pretty much equal from between both in, enrollments are equal between both institutions. Um, and then one thing with with the the MOUs that we've developed with UC Berkeley and NIU that that and. It sounds like other, you know, other universities don't do it quite the same way, but because because of the need, especially for f floss eligibility and stuff like that, right. that that if we're in a MOU with another university for one of these uh, distance course exchanges, um, that even if no students at UW Madison are enrolled, if if we've entered this agreement with another university, we are obligated to pay the instructor and hold the course because we've gone into this this agreement so I think that's about all I've got basically it's just to yeah um, to go through some of the the administrative problems but to my mind that the, the most difficult administrative thing is to try to is, is scalability you know um, going from from two institutions to three to you know to more it gets very very hard I think it's worth doing, <laughs> but I'm not quite sure how to make it happen. So, anyway. Um, All righty, so let's, uh, let's open it up for questions and comments. Kathy? Hi. Um, I've been very inspired this morning by listening to everyone's uh, models and the different possibilities, but up to this point, I've sort of been, okay, you know, I feel like uh, you know, we're coming from an institution that's in a fiscal crisis. Um, our dean, if it were up to him, would eliminate all of our electricals right now and they can be a else. And so I, I guess I need to hear, you know, I mean, is that what's going to happen or is there any potential for partnerships that are at the very least uh, fiscally neutral if there's not like some way to make it happen and bring in some revenue because if it isn't, then you know, at least on our campus, it's, it's not like that. We don't have the type of you know support that's saying, you know, this is a great opportunity for our students and, and, and the instructors themselves. I mean, you said you had to convince your faculty that you're not trying to eliminate positions with this. Our dean is trying to eliminate positions. <laughs> yeah. So you know, th th if they view it as oh, now we can eliminate positions, that would be great. And so even within the faculty, there's going to be suspicion that you know, if we if we start this distance learning partnership, then you know we can eliminate this language, you know, because students will take that instead. So you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that's really the position we're in, and I am very envious of you know a lot of the support that, that a lot of people here get. But I guess I just wanted to put that out there. Sure. Well, I'll I'll, I'll speak um, just very, very briefly, and that is, I've been 31 years at Vanderbilt, and I sometimes forget how privileged we are. Um, there is no expectation from the dean's office or the provost's office that this partnership will bring revenues to Vanderbilt. Um, there is no, at least, open conversation about, well, if we, if we, you know, enter into this partnership, then we can kind of similar language there's none of that so we are very very privileged did you want to um i'm going to keep trying to figure out you know how how to how to get get through this i mean i think i think the demand is i i know the demand is out there all over the country for for this kind of instruction um, and that that there are students who who want to learn these languages and 
so <laughs> I don't know, I'm not going to give up. And not only that, but I, I also don't see even, you know, campuses that have a solid program have, don't see any advantage in offering the distance language because their program isn't at risk. And so it's even, you know, it's not only the ones that are suffering and they get mm -hmm. canceled, it's also the ones that are like, well, you know, what, why should well, I bother doing this? I, no incentive for it. Although, it, like in our case, it's not, I mean, it's not so much the programs, it's things like, you know, rules of our Board of Regents that that are just very you know very strict that that there are you know in-state students and out-of-state students and whether we want to or or not you know those are rules that we have to uh, try to work around oh my goodness okay uh steve well, i was just going to answer uh, we're kind of having the same issue. If it wasn't for the NRC, we wouldn't really be able to all catch And I want to say our NRCs are very supportive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. But yeah. That's Not the that. thing. Um, and so one of the things that I've been exploring, because one of the issues that I have is I don't even know where the hell I would look for an MOU to be made in a, a, a national institution. It's weird. I can go make an uh, MOU with an international institution tomorrow right. like that. Very easy. What, but a domestic partnership is much harder for us. I don't know why. But one of the things that we can do, um, at least in Georgia, is that we have found that there is like a system in place that you can use the uh, Georgia uh, Board of Regents University. So anybody in Georgia can become a uh, transit student and take our classes. And that's what we're going to try to do to get people into our classes through distance uh, education. But that is the only thing that I know how to like kind of maybe work that angle, mm -hmm. if that's a possibility. Yeah, no, we have that as well. And you just pay the tuition at your campus, but not all the campuses participate. And again, it's like the, a campus that has more to offer and doesn't really mm -hmm. see an advantage. Well, I think you just have to go to the students that are interested in that like, is the main issue that we're finding. Second. So I think the biggest challenge in a situation like yours is knowing the audience knowing that there is actually an audience, knowing where it is, and, and what is between them coming to you or not, you know, in a distance language course. So we think that's an, that's an initial investment that it has to happen um, in order to decide that. So we had that we have a master's program that's completely online, and we thought it was going to be awesome, and that there's a tremendous need. Turns out there isn't really that great of a need as we thought, but we still are getting students. So then the next thing that I ran into was, or that my colleague ran into really not so much is that these students had to pay these astronomical tuition fees, because they are actually, some of them international, because we made it global, so we can be anywhere to participate in this. And so she went, she was the director of the program, went back to the university and we negotiated a special rate for that program. <coughs> so I think it, it takes a lot more legwork, but if you're invested in saving your program, then um, it will take additional like work before the rescue mission can be completed. Alberto. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I guess to to try to move the discussion further, um, I think what we what we need to develop. I mean, we as a Latin American crowd here to really develop almost like separate strategies for different languages. And, and having, having that clear, that includes the rationale. Like, why are we teaching this language? And then understanding the market, like, is there demand or not? Mm -hmm. And where is it? And the other thing we need is almost like an inventory of the resources that we already have. And a lot of our universities have been investing heavily with funding from Title VI and maybe other sources, but we have invested heavily on creating a human capital that is there. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, and the next step would be to <coughs> try to be creative and what you were talking about in the morning, like think outside the box mm -hmm. and sort of use the advantages that the, the technology is giving us to really move it forward. And, and I, I, um, I don't have a like a solution to put on the table, but it's just an invitation to run up our sleeves and then just mm -hmm. see, well, let's start with this. And, and again, I think we need different strategies for different groups of languages. 
and then and then and then what? So um, we we have had a very supportive team in developing our um, distance learning courses, and we had the MRC, which brought also a little um, additional support for that. Where we have found resistance is with the language design, because mm -hmm. they, especially Spanish, but also uh, not the case of Portuguese, but especially in Spanish faculty, but also for our Asia Center, which offers other tools, um, like tools, not to distance learning, um, that there's a perception that they are taking students away from their classes. Um, and so one of the things that we that we try to do is really work on a rhetoric of the value of language study at the university wide. And it's very labor intensive and it's a long-term project, right? So we don't hear our languages department promoting it. We don't hear the university per se promoting it, so we've been really working hard to say, here's the value of language study, here's how to distinguish the University of Utah from other state institutions, we offer these languages. You're, you're, if you come to the University of Utah, um, you have the opportunity to do more. We try to phrase it in terms of inter international mission in the university, so that's right in our mission statement, global university. We hook into that. And we also try to really um, emphasize the link between international and diversity to say these are opportunities for heritage learners. Uh, I mean, not all heritage learners want to come. Not no. all Mexicans mm -hmm. want to come and learn not one, but some do. And so really saying that this is an element of the diversity and again using it to say this is why we want to come here. Really building that and materials we work on, what kinds of publicity materials can we present, videos and so on, in our in the International and Area Studies offices to really say language study is critical. And then we privately, or not privately, but informally try to say to language faculty, you know, I know the students who are in the Nahuatl classes, they're not taking Spanish classes. Most of them are already native Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. And what I'm telling them is they should go take Spanish classes. Right. So we try to just sort of then informally counter that perception. It's an impossible task. It's, we're not going to win that battle. But at the moment, we, you know, continue to offer the course. So. Yeah, I agree with that. I would also say, since I know that y'all are interested in Portuguese, one thing that we've been working on on Vanderbilt's campus is really um, getting the word out, like, you know, creating this message that it's also really useful for undergraduates to get jobs. Um, talking about how important Brazil is now as an economy in the whole hemisphere and that we really need to be looking at that. And we have had job recruiters come to us to connect uh, them with undergraduates that are graduating with Portuguese experience. So, I mean, I think that's less true of, you know, the least commonly taught languages that we're going to be able to make those sorts of arguments. But I think any time from the universities that you can show that helps student placements post-graduation, um, it makes it more attractive. Um, okay, Amanda, and then Todd, and then Santa. Coming from a, a public university in one of the poorest states in the country, I'm very envious of the financial resources, but I actually think I'm more envious of the administrative support. And I'm really curious how this partnership came to be, like how how did administrators in these universities start talking and decide this was a commitment? I'm not sure I can answer that question thoroughly um, because I was not the first representative of the dean's office, John Sloop, who preceded me in the undergraduate position, um, was the first to step in. Um, flippantly, I would say Vanderbilt looked at something that Duke and UVA had and said, wow, that looks cool, let's go play in their court. Um, <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know. Um, we have at Vanderbilt, I think, a relative paucity of language instruction. Avery, you might have a different, but I, I think we have a relative paucity of language instruction for a university of our caliber, our size, and our wealth. And so I think that part of the attraction, and certainly part of the attraction for me, was, well, if we're not going to offer Korean, for example, um, 
how can we make other languages available to our students if we're not going to teach them ourselves? Um, so, and the upper administration, once we got into the partnership, has been very much hands off. Um, and, and I will do one shout out that I forgot, and that is our university registrar's office has been a really valuable partner in this. But in terms of the provost's office, Mm, I think they just assume this is running just fine and they're willing to, to let it go. So, whereas many of you are at institutions where you're getting pressure from upper administration, how is this valuable, how is this not draining our resources, how is mm -hmm. this bringing in revenue, ours is kind of more um, laissez-faire about it, frankly. Um, but before we but we were we did get pressure before about our low quiche enrollments. There was yes. more concern, and so I think this goes back to one of the conversations that we were having earlier. It's all about people, right? And so you have people that want to build a digital language partnership. I mean, I think we can't say we've just got to wait for that person to come in and, and make those changes. But I do think it's finding, you know, if you're at a university that wants to build one of these partnerships, it's finding the person who's going to be behind that, and then helping that person again make all of the you know reasons and the arguments for well, well and Avery gestures this. to me and smiles but I'm the nasty person who <laughs> goes around canceling under enrolled courses yeah. so before the <laughs> partnership with with Duke and UVA we did have conversations occasionally about enrollment in QJ. Yeah. understandably so yes um, okay Todd uh, building on what Amanda said uh, coming from Arizona State I guess, State universities, I, I don't think that at least state universities, it's really ever, you can't convince a dean that it's in the interest of the university uh, somehow to, to fund, but to, at least at Arizona State, you can be able to. Uh, and I also think from, especially my teaching of advanced uh, Quechua, that I, we've got 11 different students from 11 different universities calling in this year, and next year there'll be different universities. And to get an MOU between universities in the United States, as Steve said, is not feasible. It's also not feasible, I think, to set up arrangements where students are going to pay a fee from their university. It takes so long to get that going, yeah. the students oftentimes don't know about this till quite late in the year. And I want them in the class because having 11 students in there creates the dynamism. And if somebody can't pay in, I'm gonna say call in for free anyway because that extra money doesn't really, uh, it's not worth excluding the person for that. So I wonder, I, I think that the faculty teaching the <coughs> licto or, or sort of supervising it or whatever they're doing, <coughs> they can't be hired only to teach the little because it's too fragile to make a hire on. So they have to be somebody who's hired as a tenured faculty member, I don't know what, to teach Spanish, uh, literature, or, or in anthropology, or f for their other value, and then they can teach the lictal as a course buyout. And I think um, if, you, if you, I've been thinking about the value to full professors who might, be, who might be teaching in an area. Supposing we have four or five Amazonian uh, faculty somewhere who don't want to teach Kichwa themselves, one at this university, one at another, but they <coughs> need to have their graduate students take this language. Well, a buyout maybe costs six thousand dollars. For a retention for one of those professors, um, they say, um, "Give me," or, they, or, or maybe they have a ten thousand uh, dollar fund for being a, 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 a chair, or a, a named chair, or something. Three or four of those professors put together, uh, you know, a thousand five hundred dollars each. They can pay a course buyout to teach that mm -hmm. language. And, and they might be, uh, have interest in doing that. They can also, I mean, it, this is, there's again the problem of outsourcing, right? Because you talked earlier about how faculty feel like they're gonna lose their jobs. 
but there are also universities around the world that make quite a bit of money from summer uh, American students going there in the summer. And some of those places, they hire their faculty around, year round. It's not as expensive to, to work with them. But just for recruiting, they would be interested in connecting with universities um, here during the academic year. And you could, there's various ways you could combine this. But I, I think what won't work is trying to convince a dean that it's in the university's interest to, to fund small lictals, at least our dean. All right, let's do Cinta, Liesel, and then Major. There are ways that can be convinced. We've got a series of them, so I think it is possible if we're a public institution, so it worked out okay, it worked out before I got there, so it works out. I don't think have anything to do with the lictals, but I think there are deans and institutions that have a history of internationalization where that is important, but um, to build on what you just said in terms of the rescue mission of smaller programs, I think it's also important to start thinking about other opportunities outside <coughs> the box. We're talking here about credit-bearing courses. Why does it have to be a credit-bearing course? Why does it look like to be a credit-bearing course? Can I make it a fee-based program? So we have fee-based programs in our Center for Language Teaching Advancement. For people who don't, these are not like those, but for people who don't need the credits, they come and they learn German or Spanish or Vietnamese or Korean and they have a blast. And it's a way for us to give our graduate students experience teaching those courses. We pay them based on the fees we bring in. It's a way for our undergraduates to get service learning experience because we have them involved as volunteers. We offer it from three-year-olds down to senior citizens. So we have the full gaming of age groups. That's a great way to access more people. And I know that you know, Altec in Colorado, at the University of Colorado Boulder was mentioned earlier, and they have classes, again, non-credit bearing, fee-based courses that they offer online that helps them bring in the revenue to do some of the things that they want to do and give money to those instructors that need more money. So I'm thinking um, one thing that could be appealing to a dean, and maybe Karen can tell me if I'm on face or not, but thinking about um, dual enrollment programs, right? So many of us have dual enrollment programs in local high schools. What about offering LICTLs as dual enrollment options? The incentive to the administration is that these are students that you're getting early contact with that could potentially be recruited to your university. You know, I, I think that seems especially attractive for those of us who live in areas where we have large heritage communities. Um, <coughs> and there are states that have a requirement for graduation to have a language and an online course, like Michigan yeah. does. So, and so you're almost getting, because Kevin <laughs> um, comment earlier about measuring demand with the freshman class, offering it early, I thought was really interesting. Um, but I don't know, for example, for us with Quechua, where it really is, is a language that so far we don't have any institutional history or track record in the community, the need might be challenging. But what about going a step deeper? Why not Haitian Creole as a dual enrollment program? You want it as distance learning. Use them to prove that it exists and is, is worthwhile and that the university will invest, but there'll be another return on investment other than the lictal. See what you think. What do you think, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a decision made above my pay grade. Really? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Isn't that the language? Because I mean, we have to be creative about what's attractive. You have to think from the priorities of the university, right? So we've yeah. been talking about these challenges. I mean, the last thing you want to do is sell your own faculty to be dismissed, right? You have the best intentions, and then their positions get eliminated. So you have to think from the perspective of, of well, and, and I, I just think that your administration, but how is the administration? What are the priorities of the administration? Well, again, I, I, I'm speaking about an institution that is quite different from yeah. several yeah, of those fine. around the table. We don't worry about application. Well, that's not true. Right. But we we have so many more <laughs> students who apply to Vanderbilt who 
than can be admitted. It's, it's obscene, so frankly. it's not even a competition between you. Because we would like them to come to FIU, for example, instead of UF. Well, Keep them it, in Miami. Don't yeah. you know, send them up to Gainesville. Our competition is not with other institutions in the state of Tennessee, for the yeah. most part. But I like the idea of developing this in areas where there is a good core of heritage learners. Um, there's a there's occasional conversation at Vanderbilt about teaching Kurdish. We have one of the largest Kurdish op, um, uh, populations outside the U.S. Uh, outside um, Kurdistan, um, it, to the point that we were a voting site for <coughs> Kurdish elections a couple of years ago, which was really fascinating. So if it were Vanderbilt saying let's do dual, dual enrollment, I mean clearly we could do it in in Spanish. We have a large Hispanic population. Um, but Kurdish might be the place, um, you know, and I, I, I don't know what to say beyond that. Or <laughs> just, but we don't do a lot of dual right. enrollment here. We're, we're going to start that with You're Portuguese. Yeah, start with Portuguese. And because, but I think that's one of the things. Quechua is a very hard thing to sell uh, for yeah. uh, a high school student that has never heard of Quechua. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, yeah. Haitian Creole probably would be fine. Uh, Portuguese would probably be easy. Yeah. If, depending on the population, not a lot. But it's, it really depends. I think that you have that marketing. Hell, you have the marketing to undergraduate students and graduate students mm -hmm. already to figure out how you get them in there. Think about a high school student that's like, I have hands. This is amazing. <laughs> it's like a weird thing for them. And now they're going to a college campus. So I feel like there's a difference there. But, but yeah, we're going to try it. I mean, yeah, in our, in our state, yeah, there's an arrangement with a state. Like if, if a high school can't offer something, the student can make the argument that they want to study it, they can go to the university. But so who's going to pay well, that in, tuition? Well, in Miami, for uh -huh. example, they, so our instructor goes to the high school. So the high school yeah. convenes the class, and our instructor goes to the high school and delivers the course. And the high school pays for it. And the high school covers it, yeah. Wow. And then there's an agreement that FIU will ensure that, you know, that those credits yeah. would be transferred. Yeah. And it's all about getting, I mean, it's about increasing enrollment. We do that with uh, Heritage Spanish um, students with Columbus Public Schools and Southwest Schools in the Central Ohio area because we really don't have that many heritage speakers at Ohio State that we, we always had trouble having the course made so we would end up with six or seven students and, and nobody wanted that and so now we partner with some of the local school systems and have either distance or we teach the course at night and they come to campus but the original idea was that it would be distance for the high school kids. And one of those, the mechanism is already in place because those high school kids can come to OSU for the very same sorts of um, you know, as the policies and, and mechanisms that y'all talked about. And um, I had a, a conversation in January with the Ecuadorian consulate in Chicago because they had been to Ohio State to talk about Ecuador and we had a relationship building already. And one of the things that came up was that they said they had lots of heritage Quechua speakers in the Chicago area. And would we be interested in teaching a course for heritage Quechua speakers? And so we're toying with the idea about how we might go about doing that. Of course, we're in Columbus, Ohio, and they're in Chicago. But they said that they would be happy to make the consulate available for a uh, classroom space. We want to do that from distance. So there are possibilities. I think that's one of the outside the box things we need to be thinking about. Okay, Mary Jo. I was just going back to the earlier comment, um, but just you know, in terms of how, how do you find those those partner partnerships, but you know, it seems it seems to me that, you know, the the for for Latin American studies, the people around this table or for Southeast Asian studies, you know, the, the NRCs, you know, are in, in the perfect position to to spearhead whatever you know collaborative uh, solutions can can be made. Um, so you know even for 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 most of the 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 the, the bilateral sort of in, interinstitutional uh, agreements that we've made have been from NRC to NRC, and it's not the language teachers who are come who are talking to each other. It's it's the people in the NRC offices who are saying, hey, we've got this grad student in geography and you've got this grad student in poli sci or whatever. So they're finding the needs and communicating those to each other. And the public 
at large, you know, that are looking for less commonly taught languages are, are calling us to try to figure out, do you guys teach Burmese or do you, you know, whatever. So we're making the referrals. So I don't know, it's just to put it out there that, the, you know, the collaboration among the NRCs for, for this is, I think, the strongest. Okay, so we've got about 10 more minutes. Let's do Todd, and then Cinta, and then Steve. I'm really intrigued by this idea of dual enrollment. Uh, because if it's, if it's distance, you don't necessarily have to be where the community is. Like the Kurds are here, yeah. but uh, I, so for example, they're, they're the biggest uh, heritage <coughs> group Quechua would be in, in New York uh, area, uh, New Jersey, would think. But if you if you think about reaching an audience like that, I've had high school students call me and ask if they can be part of the class, and I turned them down. But if it wasn't credit bearing, or if there was some institutional way, uh, I don't know how to go connect with public schools. But if there was an outreach coordinator that could figure out how to do it. I've had conversations with the Ecuadorian Council in, in, uh, in Phoenix. Um, I, I can't imagine that the Ecuadorian government wouldn't pay at least half of a buyout uh, for the for the um, maybe they wouldn't, but I mean to find if you, if you're thinking about impacting a larger community, the idea of coming up with the money for a buyout is relatively small compared to the the large public impact that you would have. And my difficulty would be more just that I wouldn't mind having the students in the class, but I just wouldn't know how to go out and connect with the school system or to set up a, a dual enrollment program. But if there were some sort of structure which outreach coordinators could figure out, it, it does seem like that would be a good way to, to be able to get the funding to but there's still yeah. costs associated yeah. with dual well, enrollment. And credit has, to be, yeah. credit has to be part of it, because that's yeah. the reason the kids are doing it. Right, yeah. and, like, and so in Louisiana, it's got to be a Louisiana institution. Yeah. Right. Like, these are they're, these are not cross-state right. things, so it's not going to work for you with New York. New York. Um, and there's still, like, there's, there's still costs. Mm -hmm. And I will say from personal experience, because my son is about to enroll, at Tulane or a college while in high school, and I've still got to come up with the cost of the fees. Yeah. So it's not free, and it's yeah. not it's not free on Tulane either. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say also. I mean, one has to think about if if you do we we can't do that current enrollment. 
and say Utah prohibits that. But if you do, you are also getting students at a more advanced level by the time they hit your right. campus, exactly. and then do you have the more advanced yeah. courses to offer them? So right. you may be potentially draining from your academic year courses who yeah. are pressuring you to add more yeah. levels, right? So I mean, there's right. those things at additional costs, right? So there's that. Yeah. Those students are right. interesting. All right. So, uh, so I'll comment to that one. Wait, so Michigan passed a law several years ago that now uh, high school students have to have two years of high school foreign language in order to graduate. And so people are like, yay, great, but oh, what's that going to do to us? Is it going to help us or hurt us? And so one of the things was, well, is there's going to be students that are going to be upper level classes in high schools, going to be offered a distance learning that went nowhere. So I'll but we're seeing now that our enrollments at the university, 87% of our students come from the state of Michigan. And so our enrollments are changing. We used to have first and second year students primarily, and then some third and fourth year. Now we're at about half half. Hmm. We're about at an even point, which if you look at the MLA numbers is pretty impressive. Which is causing us new headaches. For example, TAs are only allowed to try to teach first and second year according to our university union contract. So now we have more staff than we need for first and second year, and not as much staff like the fourth year. Okay. We haven't solved that one yet. So I think you have to sort of change with the market and the, the laws around you. And so four things I wanted to say, um, building on what Mary Jo had said about the NRCs playing an important role. I'm in German, which is always under siege. We're like just big enough for people to be aware of us, but not big enough to actually survive. So, you know, we fight. <laughs> So our professional organization, the AATG, has put together a whole host of sets of advocacy for how we can lobby for German specifically and languages in general. And I think that you know could be something that the NRCs could put together for your languages, is that you can take those letters and argue for it in the high schools, argue for it in the communities, argue in the community. The second thing is I think the heritage speakers are an important source. We have received a very large grant from the government for Arabic because Michigan has the largest Arabic population in the country, so that they went to us and not to other places, even though we actually went to Chinese because we had Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, picking up on the um, consulate or other embassy organizations like that, the previous institution that I was at had a Finnish program that was entirely funded by the Friends of Finland club or something. I mean, it was a random connection, right? There was this club in town that for some reason there were a bunch of Finns that and one of them had a lot of money and they don't add it. Same with Norwegian got funded that way. We are in the German program very much looking for the German American businesses because some of them want to teach their staff German. So we work with them, we try to um, connect with them and offer some more classes. And then one of the biggest things that we have learned and successfully navigated with the German is understanding what <coughs> the dean and the provost and the president are currently excited about, and then twisting what we want to do to match what they're excited about. So digital humanities is awesome, mm -hmm. and we're just going to do that, and we're going to finish our graduate students in four years in their PhD program, and so on and so forth. So just connecting to these missions and working on joint hires and so on, I think that if, if you're in a small unit, that's the key to survival is connecting to something that has cloud and you just attach. I was just, I had a question for Karen on this uh, collaboration with three institutions. Is it just for the languages or is it something bigger as well and like this is a writer? It's just for the languages. Okay. I mean, there are, there are no doubt other partnerships, but um, this is a language specific partnership for the three institutions. Okay, because I was wondering if that might be another way to look at it. Is if there's another thing that's already going out there, mm -hmm. you just throw a writer on right. it and say, all right, well, we'll also do some languages. How about that? I'm sure in other yeah, cases like you might be able to do that. The CIC, that. I think, is part yeah, of yeah, their, the yeah, yeah, you know, because they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're sharing lab equipment. Yeah. They're sharing library resources and languages. <laughs> Um, I'll add just one other thing, um, again, back to Portuguese. One thing that we've been doing for the past two or three years that's been very successful is trying to, um, well, we've gotten a Fulbright foreign language teaching assistant um, in Portuguese, and so we bring <coughs> someone up from Brazil to teach Portuguese here at Vanderbilt, 
or to teach at our minority serving institution partner Fisk um, and so then you can you know it's supporting our again back to the NRC's trying to, to come together and collaborate on this it's supporting our NRC mandate to partner with MSI institutions um, but it also <laughs> If you get a really good student, they come in and they have a lot of great energy and they're young and they get the students, they get the undergraduate students really excited about the language and really engaged in the extracurricular activities around the language. And so then I think that helps create um, a swell of support of interest for the language that then you know is more appealing to the administration that you have student demand for the language. have a fairly steady flow from Brazil, so Portuguese works just fine, but right. for most of the other languages, you get, you know, come back one year and then... Right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm specifically talking about Portuguese because I think that could be the most stable. And, you know, the person's only here for one year. They may not be a great teacher. I mean, there's a lot of ifs, but I think that could be another, you know, low-cost uh, way to try to, to stimulate um, program. Um, okay, so thank you all for your <laughs> thanks everyone for all your comments. Um, okay, so now we're going to take a break and we're also going to give whoever would like to the opportunity to visit the language, the distance language classroom that we have here. We, it's a small room and the class is going to be in session. Um, so it'll be a Quiche class shared with um, Duke and UVA students and so you'll see all of them. The last group, Marika wants to give whoever's in the last group the opportunity to actually try it out. So if you're really wanting to do that, go in the last group. But I have um, some of our staff is going to come over here and take us. So we need to divide ourselves into essentially groups of about eight people each so we can fit in the room. Um, and we'll take you over there. Uh, so you can be here, you can be here in the room, or you can go and then we'll all come back here at um, four is when the next session starts. Is that right? No, 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30